Assalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here and see your wonderful, wonderful faces in this city called Manchester. The only thing that comes to my mind is Manchester United, I'm sorry. Um, so it's, <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and enlighten you. I see a lot of young people here as well. The, you are the people that I want to talk to, the young people actually. And that's my expertise. I'm a teacher and uh, I teach secondary school students. You have secondary school here? What do you call it? High school? Or? High school, yeah. High school or secondary school. So we, we always talk and I love you know, communicating with the young people, seeing what's going on in their lives and that's what I want to talk about. Um, the topics that, th these topics were chosen for me before I came here and I thought, you know, maybe they're good topics, inshallah. And um, it's about the Khulafa, the four khalif, Khalifas. And I think every young person, old person should know about them in detail. Your turn today happens to be Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu. Hands up if you know who Uthman ibn Affan is. You all know him? Well, you guys haven't met him yet, so how can you know him? All right, so Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu. Actually, you know what? Just before I talk about him, let, let me make a, a slight introduction. Um, look, we can't survive in this world without role models. You cannot survive in this world without role models. We need to look up to some people. People who we can look up to and trust. And my advice to every young person, never blind follow a single one person. Don't follow a man or a woman. Because people change and they will disappoint you. I tell my children the same thing. I am not the ultimate role model, and we shouldn't be. If you really want to follow someone and make them your role model, you might as well follow someone who has already died and already has set the standards of this great reputation and so on, because they're never going to change. And I've seen people where they take somebody and follow them so zealously, and then later on they change. These people, they lose out, they, they lose steam, and then what happens is that you get really disappointed. So my brothers and sisters, don't ever put your faith and entire trust in one single person and say they're the ultimate thing. This is what you learn when you end up being in what we call the, you know, the popular fame of things. Fame is not the best thing really because we carry a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. And, but at the same time, we need role models. People, and when we learn about the companions, I find them the extremely amazing role models in our lives. They seem like they lived 1,400 years ago or that they are different people to us. What I want to tell you is that they are not any different to any one of us. Yeah, it was 1,400 years ago. But really, what they did, how they thought, how they interacted with one another, things that they went through, you would think that they just live among us. Just like us. They are exactly like us, the companions. Except that they were around the Prophet ﷺ and they learned directly from him. But they had mistakes. They quarreled, they debated, sometimes they got upset with each other, sometimes they upset each other, sometimes they made mistakes. All of it happened, just like our time. And if anybody thinks that Islam is outdated, you are so wrong. The Qur'an is so ahead of its time. Now, I'm a science teacher as well, I teach science, I've got a science background. I even talk about evolution from an Islamic perspective. These are topics that are really important to me because I see young people, they don't know, they think that Islam is somewhere on another planet. And I don't know whose fault it is. Maybe it's ours. Maybe it's our parents. We don't want to, you know, th there's no difference between us and them. Islam is so up to date, but I think a lot of people still just don't understand it. Maybe it's the language, maybe it's the culture, maybe our seniors kind of find there are still taboo topics that we can't talk about. You know, we have to talk about these topics. You know, even like things like sex education has to be spoken about in a hypersexualized world. And Islam really talks about it immensely and you know for me this world is uh, what they say sex drugs and rock and roll these are the three main things that people rotate around you know and this is the the coming up to this man called the Dajjal the Dajjal is a deceiver he makes you see things that look normal but they're actually really bad for you you know so without further ado let's talk about Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu let's introduce his character first of all and know who he is so we can attach ourselves to this wonderful amazing personality First and foremost, brothers and sisters, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Let's make an introduction. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once sitting um, inside of this place where there was a well. And it was called the well of Aris. I don't know if you've heard of it. And in Medina. 
and he had his trousers sort of folded upwards and he was dangling his feet with a man called Abu, um, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, a, a great, amazing companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Abu Musa used to have an amazing voice in the Qur'an, by the way, if you really want to know about him. And he was standing guard at the door. Suddenly, someone knocks at the door and the Prophet ﷺ asks, who is it? And Abu Musa asks, who is it? And the man says, I'm Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. You all know who Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, let him enter and tell him that he will be in paradise. So Abu Bakr al comes in and he sits on the right side of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Then another knock came along and it was Umar, radiallahu anhu. You all know who Umar is? And he says, let him enter and give him good news that he will be in paradise. And then he sits on the right side of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Then Uthman knocks on the door radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet peace be upon him says, let him enter and tell him that he will be in paradise, but only after a great fitna, a great trial, a calamity is going to befall him. And Uthman radiallahu anhu enters while saying, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is enough for me and he is the one that I should rely on. And he goes and sits on the opposite side on the well, which indicates that the Prophet ﷺ was going to die and Abu Bakr was going to be the next Khalifa, followed by Umar, followed by Uthman. And the way that they were going to be buried is that the Prophet ﷺ is going to be buried, next to him is Abu Bakr, and next to Abu Bakr is Umar, and Uthman was going to be buried in another place called Baqiya, a little distance away from them. So this is where the story starts with Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. I wanted to introduce him that way. His story is quite sad and it's really emotional. And every one companion, you will find that you connect to one of them. These companions have different personalities and you always find someone you connect to. Like if you're a joker, you love to joke a lot and playing tricks on people, you'll connect to Nu'aim radiallahu and he used to play pranks big time. If you are a, a person who's straightforward, you know, you don't, you don't care how people feel so long as you speak the truth, even if it's against yourself, then you'll connect with Umar radiallahu anhu. If you're a soft person who likes to um, bring people closer and resolve problems between them, then you will be like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. If you're a person who is really good at judging things, then you are like Ali radiallahu anhu. If you're a person who is really good at speaking and influencing people and really good at talking, then you're like Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. Right? For me personally, I connect with, personally in my childhood, with Mus'ab ibn Umayr and Uthman radiallahu anhu. You're going to learn about what Uthman radiallahu anhu's character really was and why some of us connect to him. So Uthman radiallahu anhu, he was a tradesman. He was an entrepreneur. He was an extremely wealthy man. He was extremely successful in his business. He had the gift of negotiating and making money a lot, a lot, a lot. I'm talking in the millions. He would give them away and would make more millions. He'd give millions away and make more millions. The guy, mashallah, just played with money. Subhanallah. But one thing about Uthman radiallahu anhu is that he was extremely shy. Now, there's a difference between saying that someone is shy and someone who has modesty. Uthman radiallahu anhu was shy, but he had modesty in that sense. You know, when somebody is so shy, you ask them, what's your name? And they go, <laughs> my name. Not like that. A Muslim shouldn't be shy like that. You should be, you should speak when it needs to be spoken, right? And Uthman Adelan wasn't like that. He was just a very modest man. Like to the point where he didn't like to show even a little bit of his chest. He used to cover it. He didn't like showing his body. He didn't like showing off his body, even though he had a really good physique. Uthman Adelan, anhu was so modest and shy that the Prophet wasallam used to say, you all know the famous hadith, I am embarrassed of Uthman. And why would I not be embarrassed in front of him when the angels themselves are embarrassed of this man? He was the only companion whom the angels were embarrassed of. And there is a little story about the Prophet wasallam, where he was sitting in his house with his wife Aisha radiallahu anha. And they had their, they actually were covered in a blanket. The Prophet was sitting on the floor in his house. It's only one room. There are no two rooms in it, one big room. And he was sitting down while the blanket was on him and his wife sharing the blanket. So for the men and the brothers and sisters who were married, hint, hint, wink, wink, you know, put a blanket over you and sit together. He was sitting with his, one of his legs was a bit outside. It was outside the blanket. And you could see a little bit of his thigh as well, right? So some of the brothers might say, 
Should I cover my thigh? Yes. Just above your ankles, you can sh above your knees, you can show it from this hadith, but not more than that. So you've got to have some shyness, right? Modesty. And the Prophet ﷺ, he is the door knocking, and it was Abu Bakr, the Aisha father. And he enters and asks the Prophet ﷺ something, and then next comes Umar, happens to be Umar. He enters, and then Aisha sort of moves away a little bit, but she's still there doing her own thing. And the Prophet ﷺ is sitting as he is. His leg is out, he's relaxed, no problem with Abu Bakr and Umar. Then Uthman is about to enter, and the Prophet ﷺ says, tell him to wait. So he fixes his trousers, he fixes the blanket, he puts his leg under the blanket, he sits upright. And he enters and Uthman asks him for what he, what he wants. When he left, Aisha radiallahu said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, you didn't cover yourself up and sit right with Abu Bakr and Umar, but with Uthman you did, what's the problem? And he said, Ya Aisha, Uthman, I am embarrassed of him, he is a shy man, and the angels are shy of him. And I thought, if I stayed sitting the way I was, he'll be so shy to enter and asks me for what he wants. I fear that he'll walk away and not ask me for what he wants because of the way I was sitting. That is Uthman radiallahu anhu. Now he was very handsome. He was tall. He had a wide, wide shoulder, wide chested radiallahu anhu. He had a light tan. The Arabs used to call a person who had a light tan as white. This is how we address people who are white, with a light tan. But people who look British and so on, they used to call them yellow people. So the, the Arabs who were light tan, they call them white. And Uthman al was quite white. He was at a very light tan. He had reddish, reddish hair. He had some redness in his hair, if you really want to know exactly what it looks like. He had some natural redness in his hair. He had long hair that passed his ears. Long used to come down to his shoulders and curl a little bit on his shoulders. He had a long, thin nose. It was a little bit slightly hooked on the top. He had nice eyes, very big desert eyes. Um, and he had bulging joints, which means that he was a strong man. And uh, he was, uh, as I said, he had straight legs, thick shins, and he was very pleasant to look at. But he didn't speak much. He wasn't a good public speaker. He was really good at his business, subhanAllah. Amazing man. He was kind. He was gentle. He was shy, as we said, very modest, extremely patient with people. And because of that, before Islam, everybody loved him. Who wouldn't love a man like that? Everybody loved him. Everywhere he went, people loved him. He had no problems with anybody. Osman once said about himself, I'll just tell you, this is what he says about himself, just to know his qualities in summary. One time when he became the Khalifa, somebody wanted to talk about him. And this is what happens when you're in a spotlight or a leader. Some people don't like your leadership if you are firm and fair. Some people who don't like fairness, they're going to lose out. So what do they do? They try to talk about the leaders, good leaders. Good leaders. And Uthman was a good leader. There are some bad leaders that should be spoken about. But good leader? Only the people who are unjust won't like them because they set them straight. So what this person said one day, he said something bad about Uthman and then Uthman introduces himself. He says, there are 10 things that I wanted to keep between me and Allah, but now you're forcing me to talk about it. O oh people, I am the fourth man to embrace Islam. Fourth. I have never lied in my life, not before Islam or after Islam. My right hand never touched my private part after it shook the hand of the Prophet wasallam ever. He said, no Friday passed except that I freed a slave. Every Friday he would... If he had a slave, he would free them. If he didn't have a slave, he would go to the market, buy them, because there used to be wars and there used to be slaves. He would buy a slave and free them. Every Jumu'ah. I never committed fornication, zina, before Islam or after Islam. I never slept with a woman that wasn't lawful for me. I prepared the army of Usrah, the army that fought in the Battle of Tabuk against the Romans, the first fight with the Romans. The Romans attacked the Muslims, and the Muslims had to defend, and it was one of the worst battles that ever happened to the Muslims. And Uthman radiallahu anhu prepared them. And I'll come to that in a minute. The, he said, I married the Prophet sallallahu first daughter. I, I, I married the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's daughter, Ruqayya. She died. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa offered me his second daughter. I married his second daughter, Umm Kulthum. And she died as well. To the point where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa called me Dhul Nurain, the man of the two lights, Ruqayya 
and Umm Kulthum radiallahu anhumah. He also said, I never stole before Islam nor after Islam. That was Uthman radiallahu anhu. High values, great principles before Islam and even better after Islam. My brothers and sisters, Uthman radiallahu anhu was one of the ten promised paradise in one sentence. Now, the Prophet did promise other people paradise. But why do we talk about the ten promised paradise all the time? It's only because of one thing. That one day the Prophet ﷺ stood and he mentioned ten names in a row. But there are others promised paradise like Khadija radiallahu anha, Fatima, Zayd, um, Fatima radiallahu anha, Baraka, Ummu, Ayman. There are so many that were promised paradise. But these are the ten promised in one go. It was Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman was the third and Ali radiallahu anhu and many others. He was one of the first who ever wrote. He was the first to write the first ayah of the Qur'an with his own hands. He was one of the scribes that wrote the Qur'an. The scribes who wrote the Qur'an, there were 22 of them, by the way. And if you want to know their names, they are Zayd ibn Thabit, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Abban ibn Ubay, Ar Arqam ibn al-Arqam, Thabit, Hanzala, Khalid ibn al-As, Khalid ibn walid Zubair, and others. 22 of them who you wrote the Qur'an directly from the tongue of the Prophet وسلم, on anything they found. And Uthman was among the first. He was the first to write the first verse of the Qur'an, as I said. I want you to remember that, because we're going to come back to that. One day the Prophet وسلم, was climbing Uhud, the mountain of Uhud. And with him, there was Abu Bakr, عنه, Umar, and Uthman. You probably know the story. And the Uhud shook. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Uhud, be stable Uhud, for on top of you walking is a Prophet, a Siddiq, Abu Bakr anhu, you should probably go back to the talk I gave in um, London about him, and two martyrs, I want you to remember this, this word, Shahidain. And the two martyrs were, Umar anhu, he was stabbed and killed by Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, the, 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 the fire worshipper, and Uthman, he is also a Shaheed, a martyr. He is going to be killed and murdered unjustly. Rasulullah said, and this hadith is in Musnad Ahmad, he said, The most merciful in my ummah is Abu Bakr. The most firm in religion is Umar. The most truthful in modesty is Uthman. The most knowing in halal and haram is Mu'adh ibn Jabal. The most knowing reciter of the Quran is Ubay. The most knowing about compulsory acts is Zayd ibn Thabit. The most greatest judge is Ali. And every nation has its most trustworthy for it. And Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah is the trustworthy of this ummah. The Prophet sallallahu said, Three matters, whoever saves themselves from its trial is safe. What are they? Number one, my death. Prophet's death, you've got to save yourself. Muslims almost lost themselves and they were apostates when he died. The Dajjal. When the Dajjal comes out, the, three, the second greatest trial. If you are safe from him, you are safe. And the third trial, the murder of a Khalifa who will persevere tremendously and is on the truth. Who is this Khalifa? Well, Abdullah ibn Umar says, one day I'm sitting with the Prophet and the man passed us. I didn't recognize who the man was. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, This man who is wearing headgear will be killed wrongly and oppressively. Ibn Umar goes, I looked up and it was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. The Prophet ﷺ foretold that he will be killed oppressively. And one day when he prepared the army of Usra, when the Muslims were fighting the Romans in Tabuk, um, Uthman ibn Affan comes and prepares the entire army. And the Prophet وسلم, says, ما ضر ما فعل Uthman بعد اليوم. Uthman can do anything after today and nothing will ever harm him again. No sin that he ever does will ever harm him from preparing that army. One day, the Prophet وسلم, said to Aisha, Ya Aisha, can you call my companion? And she said, who? Abu Bakr? He said, no. She said, who? Umar? He said, no. She said, who? Uthman? It's always in that order, subhanAllah. He said, yes. So Uthman comes in and he asks Aisha to move away a little bit. He needs to talk to Uthman something quietly. So he says to Uthman, something which made Uthman's face go pale. He says, 
you will be subjected to a fitna of killing. Do not fight or resist them. Don't fight back when that time comes. But be patient. Be patient. When the day came and they told him, we will fight you and kill you, do not be the Khalifa anymore, resign. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, they will come to you to tell you to take off your cloak. Do not fight them and do not take off your cloak. And from that day, Uthman said, I promise not to do that. Do you know why brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ told him, don't fight them and don't take off your cloak? Because the people who are going to be fighting him, wanting to kill him, are going to be none other than Muslims themselves. And the Prophet ﷺ does not want Muslims to fight each other. Because one day, the Prophet ﷺ was approached by Jibreel ﷺ. And he said, I asked Allah for three things. He gave me two and he denied me one. The first one, O oh Allah, do not wipe off my ummah because of a plague, an epidemic. And Allah gave me that. Number two, O oh Allah, do not wipe off my ummah by an open enemy, an enemy outside of Islam. And Allah gave me that. Muslims have never been defeated by an outside enemy, ever. And he asked him for the third. He said, O oh Allah, do not destroy my ummah from an enemy within them. Like if they fight each other. And Allah did not give me that. And Allah sent down the verse. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah will not change the state of a people until they change the state that is within themselves. If we fight each other, we backbite each other, we gossip about each other, we judge each other, we call each other all these names, we group each other into names. You know, I used to follow a name grouping. I don't do that anymore. I left that a long time ago from the disgust which I saw. And I'm sorry, I have to say this. I'm 42 years old now and I've seen stuff, you know, like groupings and namings. I don't, I don't use names at all. You know, we, don't, we shouldn't be like that. And we definitely shouldn't turn into like, a, I call it, sometimes we can turn into a gangster mentality within religion. You know, if you, once there was this title called Thugs in the Masjid. What a great title. You know, amazing. Let us be sincere, inshallah. So let's talk about Uthman more. And Uthman radiallahu anhu, whose conversion is quite interesting, he was sitting with his auntie one day. He loved his auntie, which tells us that he connected his ties with his family. Anyone got aunties and uncles here? I don't mean the auntie and uncle that Lebanese and Pakistanis say. Auntie, uncle, everybody's an auntie and uncle. All right, not that type, like really blood uncle and auntie. Do not cut them off. If you cut your family off, your children will cut you off because children don't obey us, but they always imitate us. Remember those words, my dear brothers and sisters. So Uthman radiallahu anhu, he goes out, he hears about the Prophet's qualities and he meets Abu Bakr. And then he converts on the spot with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because he knows Abu Bakr is so truthful. So he goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a really funny story. Uh, well, interesting. A love story. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had his daughter Ruqayya and Uthman ibn Affan, he wanted to get married. Now, Uthman ibn Affan had always had his eye on Ruqayya. Now, I've got young people, they always ask me, they say, bro, no, some of them say bro, they forget that I'm their teacher, by the way. This is how we're connected at school, right? I say, bro, I'm not your bro. He goes, oh, sorry, sir, it's just sometimes we forget. So that's good, it's good that we have a good connection. Anyway, some of them, they ask me, they're in year 9, year 10. Do you have your 9, year 10 here? Okay. So I go... All right, what's the problem? And they say, is it okay for me to like a girl? And another girl says, is it okay if I have a crush on someone? I say, well, if you're really hungry and you want to eat, is it okay to be hungry? I say, yeah, well, that's a natural thing. It's okay to like someone. It's okay to think one day I'll marry this person. That's fine. That's a natural thing. Nothing wrong with that. But stick within the halal boundaries. Make it halal. <laughs> Right? They call it the halal gap now, the students. They go, this is how you see it. You've got to sit in the halal gap. There's also a halal high five. They go like that. They don't touch. So I say to them, look, it's okay to like someone, but keep it halal. Wait. Wait. Because if I put you, when you're fasting in one room, you know, if you're fasting in Ramadan, and I put you in your room, you are very hungry, and I fill this room with food and cakes and beautiful fresh food, and I leave you there long enough, what are you going to do? You're going to eat. You're going to break your fast, no matter how pious you are. All right? If you get hungry enough. 
So if a boy and a girl like each other and you're in a room together and you keep chit-chatting together and you're already in year nine, you just hatched out of the egg, you know, 14, 15, just reached puberty and you want to go on to this love mission and then, you know, you're not going to get married until you, after finish, you finish year 12. That's a long time. You know, your temptations are not going to wait that long. So keep it halal and wait for the future to get married to that person. Nothing wrong. You know, I've, I'm a marriage celebrant in Australia. I've done marriages for a lot of my ex-students. And I think it's quite cute. Right? I've done their marriages and I say, wow, man, you guys hit it from else. We didn't know that you guys liked each other. I go, it means you kept it halal. Nobody knew about it. I don't know if they did or didn't, if their friends knew or not. But high school sweethearts, that's fine. So long as you keep it halal and you let your parents know, you don't go off doing haram stuff because you're going to be very heartbroken and many, many problems are going to happen. So, Abu, so Uthman radiallahu anhu loved this girl. Ruqayya, he always had his eye on her. And what happened was that Ruqayya was engaged to um, Abu Lahab's daughter, the Prophet's uncle who hated him, Abu Lahab. You know Abu Lahab? He, she was engaged to, he was engaged to his daughter to marry her. And then Abu Lahab, he, when Islam came in, he hated to give uh, I'm sorry, Abu Lahab's son was engaged to the Prophet's daughter Ruqayya. And in order to make his nephew upset and hurt his feelings, he said to his daughter, Don't marry, he said to his son, Don't marry his daughter. And so he broke off the relationship. SubhanAllah, Uthman radiallahu anhu embraces Islam only a couple of days later and he marries her. Because Allah wanted Ruqayya to marry a good man. So he marries, she marries Uthman. And they are the sweethearts of their life. He ends up marrying her. And the Prophet ﷺ gives him Ruqayya and he couldn't be any happier. A day came when Uthman migrated from Mecca, from Mecca to Abyssinia. You know the first migration, the Hijrah. And he took with him Ruqayya. And they suffered a lot in this journey, subhanAllah. But she was so patient with him. And when they returned, when they returned, they had to migrate a second time. And this time they migrated to Medina. The Hijrah to Medina. When Uthman al migrated to Medina, he went there and they still lived all this time. They had a beautiful love story together. Just cutting the story short because I want to get to the most important part. And then there came the first battle called the Battle of what? What's the first battle? The Battle of Badr. Okay, for the Muslims. Now, all the Muslims, most of the Muslims took part in that. And that was the most famous and amazing battle that whoever fought in that was called the Badri. The Prophet made dua. He said, anyone who fought in the Battle of Badr their dua was always accepted and no sin will ever harm them. But Uthman radiallahu anhu didn't actually take part in the battle of Badr. You know why? Because his wife Ruqayya radiallahu anha became ill and she was on her deathbed. And the Prophet sallallahu didn't want Uthman to leave his wife behind. So he says to Uthman, Ya Uthman, I will fight on behalf of myself and you. I will do it. One arrow for me, one arrow for you. And you will be a secret soldier with us in the battle of Badr. And I will call you a Badri. You can't go because you've got to look after Ruqayya, my beautiful daughter. So Uthman al stays back to look after his daughter. When the Prophet ﷺ returns from the battle of Badr, two days before he arrives, he gets the news that Ruqayya had died. Yearly. Only a few years had passed in the ninth year of Hijrah. And Umm Kulthum also dies. And now Uthman is single again. And he has to go through the heartbroken procedure all over again. So Uthman anhu didn't deserve it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that he can handle it. And he's going to be a great role model. <coughs> Brothers and sisters in Islam, he was named that day Dhun Nurain. How beautiful it is, you know, when how Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam counsels people. That he's so sad and so heartbroken. And he gives him a name that lasts. 1,400 years later, we call him Dhun Nurain. The man of the two lights. What a beautiful therapy to heal his heart, subhanAllah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, pass a few things because it's very, it's very long to talk about Uthman. You know, I can take maybe 10 lectures about it. But I'm going to skip a few things to go to this. Remember when I told you about Uthman being extremely generous? Did I tell you that he was extremely generous? Yeah. Uthman was the most generous in giving donations. Well, not the most generous, but he was the one that they relied on for anything that they ever needed because he was extremely wealthy and he never held back. One of the ways he used to be generous, he didn't just give away money to poor people. That's what he did every day. But one of the, and I want you to remember this, subhanAllah, for those of you who, are, who do have, you know, like businesses or companies or those of you who have got skills and able to employ people, this is what I want you to learn from Uthman and Ali radiallahu This is what they used to do. They used to focus on looking on people 
who they can um, sponsor them to give them skills and qualifications. And then they would invest in them so that they can become skillful and work. And then, and then provide work for others. This is the best type of investment of helping people. Because if you give a poor person something to eat, they eat it and it's gone. Which is a great virtue. But investing in, in, in giving people skills, you're benefiting the entire community. And that's what Uthman radiallahu anhu used to do. He used to invest in people like millions. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to make people skillful. Anyway, one day, the Muslim refugees, there were Muslims coming from Mecca and they were refugees. And they were you know, very hungry and they didn't have shelter. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to look after them. And he did also didn't have enough wealth to look after them. The Muslims didn't. So he approaches Uthman radiallahu anhu. And he says to him, uh, Ya Uthman, we need to feed these people and give them water and we need to something, you know, they, they haven't got anything to drink. And Uthman radiallahu anhu, there was, there was a well actually, a well that belonged to a Jew. And Uthman radiallahu anhu, you know, knew that the Muslims needed that well, they needed water, they needed to graze, they needed to, you know, grow their crops, they needed to drink from it. It meant a lot, especially for the refugees that came from um, Mecca. So, the Medina people wanted to grow their crops and employ the people who had migrated, right? So they needed to eat and drink, they needed that water. That's how it survived, it was desert. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted to buy that well because that Jew wouldn't give people and he was charging so much money for it. So they go to offer the Jew, you know, to buy this well and the Jew, you know, puts a tremendous price on it. And the price was 20,000 dirhams. Equivalent to US dollars is 40,000 US dollars. Equivalent dirhams till today. One dirham is about 80. What's, so you've got a pound, and what's less than a pound? What do you call it? Pence? Pennies? Pennies. So it's 80 pennies, about. It's about 40 cents Australian. So 80 pennies. And 12 dirhams was one dinar. Okay? So I've made the calculation myself. It turns out to be 40,000 US dollars to buy this well. I don't know how much it is in pounds. And Uthman al goes and buys it and donates it to the Muslims. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. Rasul says to another companion, he says, do you want to buy the well? He goes, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I'd rather not, I'd rather, you know, set, spend my money on something else. He goes, if you buy it, you will have Jannah. So Uthman hears about this and he comes up to Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, will I get that deal if I buy it? He says, of course, Ya Uthman, you will get Jannah for it. He goes, I bought it. 40,000, give it away. It's for the Muslims to graze their crops, and to water their crops and everything. Guess what, brothers and sisters? Guess what? 1,400 years later, this well is still under Uthman radiallahu anhu's name. And it is called Bi'r Uthman, the well of Uthman, which is about 500 meters away from the Prophet's mosque. And it is protected by the Ministry of Agri Agriculture in Saudi Arabia. And it continues to supply to the crops and lands nearby. And gold dinar is equal to about 4.5 grams of, of gold today, right? So do the math. He gave 1,000 dinars and he brought them to the Prophet ﷺ and spilt them in the masjid in front of the Prophet ﷺ. They are equivalent to 220,000 US dollars in cash. He spilt them in front of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ was so shocked. He grabbed the coins and he just, he started looking at them, turning them upside down, this way and that way. You know, like a person who's really shocked. He turns them and he goes, he says, nothing will harm Uthman after this day, no matter what he does. And it's in Sunan Tirmidhi, Sahih Hadith. Ma darra Uthman ma fa'ala ba'da al-yawm. He's, he's in shock. This is the only words that came from the Prophet Sallallahu One day, at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's khilafah, the Muslims were in strife. And merchants, you know, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman had brought in a large cavalry from Syria. Please bear with me, brothers and sisters. Can, can, you, can you like wait another 25 minutes listening to, to Uthman? Yes. Your backs are going to hurt a little bit. So if you need to leave, please leave. You're not going to upset me or anybody, okay? If you need to leave, please go. I understand. But for those of you who want to stay back, I want to continue it because there are things that you're going to learn about that I think a lot of Muslims don't know about Uthman. And that's the end part of his life. It's very important for us to know about it. Anyway, um, what was I saying? Yeah, he brings in a cavalry at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. It's a huge, you know, camels carrying a lot of merchandise. We're talking about millions of dollars maybe. Australia, um, US. 
So all the merchants of Medina, they go up to Uthman and they tell him, listen, Uthman, our people, you know, we're in strife. We need to feed the poor and the hungry. You know, we'll give you for every 10 dirhams worth of your products, 10 dirhams, we'll give you 12 profit. So two, two dirhams profit for every 10 dirhams. And he goes to them, nah, I've been offered a greater profit for it. So they go to him, all right, for every 10 dirhams, we'll give you 15 dirhams. Five dirhams profit for every 10 dirhams. And he says, nah, I've been offered more. So they go to him, we'll give you 10 folds for each dirham. One dirham will give you 10 dirhams profit for the Muslims. And he goes, nah, I've been given more. And these are the merchants of men. These are the biggest businessmen. They go, oh, man, we, we can't afford more. Like this is all of us together. We can't afford more than that. Tenfold profit. He said, the one who has offered me more than tenfolds is Allah. In the Quran, Allah says, who would like to, in Surah Al-Hadid, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا فَيُضَاعِفَهُ لَهُ وَلَهُ أَجْرٌ كَرِيمٌ Allah calls out, He says, Who would like to lend Allah alone? And He will repay you for it many, many folds over. So He said, It is all for the sake of Allah for the Muslims. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when the Prophet ﷺ died, Uthman's reaction was that he could not hear anyone saying salams to him anymore. He was so shocked and paralyzed. People said salam to him, he didn't know how to say wa alaykum as salam. And he couldn't walk from his love for the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Next, Abu Bakr anhu became the Khalifa, and Uthman anhu pledged allegiance to him. And then after Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he, Abu Bakr anhu elected Umar. And Uthman radiallahu anhu was the biggest supporter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's election of Umar radiallahu anhu. And he actually wrote the agreement. There's a long story to it. And what I'm interested in telling you about is how Uthman radiallahu anhu was elected as the Khalifa after Umar radiallahu anhu. Now from here onwards, brothers and sisters, I'm going to bring you new information that will benefit us, benefit us a lot as a community. Abu Bakr anhu was an example of communities apostating and communities not wanting to fulfill certain obligatory acts of Islam. Umar anhu came to show us how a leadership, how a community can be kept in line. Uthman radiallahu anhu comes along to teach us something else. When a community starts to kill each other. Well, actually that was Ali radiallahu anhu. Uthman, when a community starts to defame one another. Starts to put each other down. And call each other names. And start to accuse and abuse. And they have no more shame or modesty or respect for even the greatest of imams for the most religious of brothers or sisters, for their own family. Uthman radiallahu anhu was going to teach us how to resolve feuds when it's between Muslims. So let's have a look. When Umar radiallahu anhu was dying, Umar was dying, he gathered the most important of his companions and he said to them, I want you to choose a new leader Khalifa for the Muslims. So they said to him, Why don't you choose, O Umar, like Abu Bakr chose you? He said, I will not choose as Abu Bakr chose, and I cannot carry the burden of choosing someone after my death. If I choose him, Allah is going to ask me. Abu Bakr is different. I am not like Abu Bakr. Which shows us that electing a Khalifa does not have one black and white process. The process is whatever is good for the people. Anyway, one companion stood up and he goes, O oh Uthman, I mean, O oh Umar, choose your son, Abdullah. He's worthy. But Umar replies, May Allah fight you. Allah to this person. He said, Wallahi, you did not intend good by this nomination. You just want to please me. 
You just want to look good in front of me. You know, I'm the imam, your celebrity, your greatest whatever. You just want to make me, you just want to look good in front of me by telling me, choose your son. Omar <laughs> did not fall for that. He goes, enough for one person from Al-Khattab family to lead and carry this burden. I don't need to carry the burden after my death with my son carrying that burden. That's enough. Wallahi, if I meet Allah with nothing for me and nothing against me, I'm happy. You see what I mean, brothers and sisters? We go on social media and we're the quickest to give fatwas and then we're going to carry the responsibility for this fatwa, cut and paste stuff. And if somebody, you know, a name is called out, we're the quickest to attack them and to talk about them. When someone's called out, we feel jealous. Let's defame them so I can look good. SubhanAllah, do you know this stuff? Not everyone does it. I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking, this is what we hear. You know, this, this self-obsession. Social media has made us self-obsessed. Everybody has a voice now on social media. Okay, that's good. But let's use it in a good way. People want attention. Me, 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 myself or I. All this narcissism that we've got. You know what narcissism is? Everything's about me. No emotions or feelings for others. Uthman radiallahu anhu hated that. And Umar radiallahu anhu hated that. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Bakr hated that. So anyway, Umar radiallahu anhu said, if Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah was still alive, I would nominate him. Because he's the trustworthy of this ummah. If Salman, Mu'adh's ex-slave, ex-slave, you can see Islam made everyone equal. If he was alive, I would have chosen him. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he is a man of Jannah. Then he goes, however, among those promised paradise, there are six of them who I can recommend. That's what Umar Adilano said. He said, Ali is one, Uthman, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Az Zubair ibn Al-Awam, and Talha ibn Ubaidillah. He mentioned six, but there was a seventh that was still alive, but he did not mention him. You know who it was? No, his name was Sa'id. Radiallahu anhu. The reason Umar didn't mention Sa'id was because he knew that Sa'id did not have the skills and qualifications to lead. And that's part of a leadership's responsibility. Is to not put people in the wrong positions. But the other six, he said, choose one of them. And this is what Umar said exactly. He said, I'm guessing that the people, listen carefully, I'm guessing that the people will choose between Ali or Uthman. Because Umar knows the quality of Ali and Uthman, and he knows that the people might choose him. What's more important than that is listen exactly what Umar said. He said, the people will choose. Leadership depends on what the people... You know, Rasulullah said in the Sahih Hadith, if a person forces himself to be the leader of, of a people, and the people don't like him to be their leader, then his leadership is false and he should be taken off. You know that, right? Leadership is carrying the responsibility of the people. If they hate you and they don't want you, why? We cannot force, we don't have an anarchy in Islam. And the people also get to decide. Anyway, Umar then says, if they cannot agree, these six people, to choose one of them, then vote. Get these six people to vote on one of them. If the vote ends up half-half, like you got three and three among the six, he said, then let my son Abdullah ibn Umar choose from the half where Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is with. So three, if Abdul Rahman is with that three, choose one of them. You see, Umar is, is direct because he doesn't want anyone to stuff up. And then he goes, let Abdul Rahman ibn Auf chair the meeting in place and time that he wants. You have only three days after my death, to elect a leader. Why? Because the Muslims were going to divide. And you know what the Prophet ﷺ had said about Umar before he died? He said, Umar is the door of this Ummah. And once the door is gone, fitna will never end. And Umar said, did the Prophet ﷺ say the door will be opened or will it be, will it be um, crushed? Broken. And the Sahabi said, Oh Umar, the Prophet said it will be broken. He said, If it's broken, then the fitna will never end. He knew that. So he said, Elect the Khalifa immediately within three days. So what happened? A meeting was held and the Sahabas disagreed on who the next Khalifa will be. So Abdul Rahman ibn Auf goes, If anyone withdraws their name, he will have the right to elect the Khalifa. All agree? And I go, All right. 
And only Abdul Rahman ibn Auf withdrew his name, but Ali radiallahu anhu disagreed. He said, I will not allow you to elect the Khalifa until you first promise to be just. You have to promise not to favor relatives. You have to promise not to put people's welfare, you, you have to promise to put the people's welfare only in your decision. If you promise, I agree to obey your decision. You see how it's always about the people? And then Ali radiallahu anhu agrees with that. Abdurrahman ibn Auf says, give me a few days. He goes around after the death of Umar radiallahu anhu, and he goes around to all the people. He goes to Banu Hisham. Banu Hisham are the Prophet's relatives. They chose Ali. And then he goes to everyone else, Banu Umayyah and the rest, and they chose Uthman. The majority was Uthman. Banu Hashim were the only ones who chose Ali radiallahu anhu. After a few days, Abdurrahman ibn Auf comes back and he asks Ali, he says, Ya Ali, who do you think is the fittest to be the Khalifa? He says, Uthman. So he goes to Uthman, Ya Uthman, who do you think is fittest to be the Khalifa? He goes, Ali. Same problem. So Abdurrahman ibn Auf tries again, talking to Banu Hashim, Banu Umayyah, you know, the, 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 the tribes, and one belonged to Uthman, the other belonged to Ali. There was no agreement. So next Fajr, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf stands up and he announces. He said, O oh Muslims, all the people. Now you can imagine, Medina is small, you've got all these people. And then he comes up and he goes, I have, thought, I have thought long and hard. And I have talked to different people. I hope you will not differ on my decision. O oh Uthman, stand up and promise that you will act according to the commandments of the Quran and the Sunnah and his two Khalifas before you. Abu Bakr and Umar. Uthman stands up and he says, I promise and pledge to the best of my knowledge and ability. And everybody pledges, including Ali radiallahu anhu. And he follows Uthman. Uthman makes his first address to the people. You know what he said? This is a bit funny, I found it. That's the quality of Uthman. He stands up and he says two lines. He goes, O oh people, it's not easy to manage a new horse. Uh, there'll be other occasions to speak to you. If I live, I will address you another day. <laughs> you all know I'm not very good at public speaking. He sits down and leaves the people. From here, everybody knows that Uthman is a softy. He's forgiving. He just wants peace. He wants people to live together. If he makes a mistake, he says, tell me, man. Tell me and I'll, I'll fix it. He would cry a lot. So he would try his best to keep the peace between people. And you know what? Allah didn't just put Uthman there for no reason. It's not just coincidence. Uthman was there because the type of people that he was about to lead. This type of people that he was about to lead needed forgiveness. Needed that you need to sacrifice yourself in order to create peace. The time of Ali radiallahu anhu, he had to fight. But Uthman was a time of sacrificing yourself for the benefit of the Ummah. So Uthman Adilan was perfect for it. Uthman led the Ummah for 12 whole years, longer than all the four Khalifas. 11 years of absolute triumph to Islam. Conquests upon conquests happened and the lands of the Arabs were returned back to the Muslims. These conquests were not that they attacked. They just returned land that belonged to the Muslims, that were ruled by the Persians before and by the Romans. Islam doesn't go and attack lands and takes it by force just because we, we're supposed to lead the world. You make peace with them and you take back the lands that were belonging you know, to you, if you can. However, in the time of Uthman al they gave him three options. They said either if you want to convert to Islam, you become our brothers and you lead your land, you know, we're not going to take it over. Or you've got to pay a tax to us, man, because you're a threat. We haven't got a peace agreement. That tax will go towards you anyway. And the tax was less than zakat. And that tax meant that we will defend you and protect you and we'll stand for you. And you know what? Everybody agreed. Because the Romans and the Persians never did that. They used to be oppressive to them. And so they loved how Uthman and Umar and Abu Bakr dealt with them. People loved being under Islam. The first thing that Uthman radiallahu anhu does when he becomes a Khalifa, the first day, you know what he does? I want to show you justice and fairness, how, how it creates a good ummah. One of the sons of Umar radiallahu anhu, 
he gets upset that his dad was killed. So he goes and talks to his brother and he says, Hey, I saw these two men, they're Persians. They helped Abu Lu'lu'a to, to kill our dad. And they had this dagger and it's the same dagger that was in their hands. So one of them, Ubaidullah, son of Umar, he goes and kills these men and murders them without a trial, without a court. Uthman radiallahu anhu finds out, he gets Ali radiallahu anhu. He says, what do you think? And all the companions. All the companions said he's all right. He had the right to kill him because there's evidence. Ali radiallahu anhu says, one man's witness is not enough to prove, not enough to prove the two guilty. So Uthman is in a problem. In order to solve the problem, Uthman does his first act which shows you how he dealt with the people. Uthman gets up and he says, I am the acting guardian of those two Persians that are living under Islam because they have no other family. So I am going to pay from my own wealth the blood money on behalf of these two men for their families who are left behind, their wives and children. Who is in favor of this decision? And they all said, we are all in favor of this decision. So from here on, Uthman takes it upon himself to solve problems. And as you can see that he's going to sacrifice his wealth and himself just to keep the Muslims together. One day, Uthman puts officials and officers in different states and he says to them, be just in your dealings, be honest with your money matters. Be fair and tolerant to the non-Muslims. There were non-Muslims who were living under Islam and he said be fair and tolerant to them. To keep their word and promises even with the enemy. They were no more than servants and guardians over the people and he said to them do not be like masters or rulers. This was the policy of Uthman anh, just like Umar and Abu Bakr. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, the Prophet's maternal uncle, he was made an officer, a governor of Kufa. Kufa is in Iraq. And the Muslims had taken over Kufa and the Persians were out. So Kufa is under the governance of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. A letter from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud reaches Uthman and says to him, because Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was made an inspector on the governors. You see? He made sure that the governors did their work well. See how much justice and fairness there was. And nobody got upset with anyone else. But soon, there are going to be people who are going to get upset from truth and justice. They are the people who did not embrace Islam during the time of Muhammad There were people from Iraq and Basra and Sham, Greater Syria and Egypt who did not live the spirit of Islam, but they were under the rules of Persians and Romans and all they knew was dictatorship, authority. So they became Muslims just to survive and they are the people who are going to cause the trouble yet to come. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas borrowed some money. And he promised to pay it on a certain time, but he was late in his payment. Uthman ibn Affan takes Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas off his post. Why? He says, my officers and rulers, my governors, have to be the best role models. If they delay their debts, everybody else is going to delay their debts. So he takes him off immediately. And he keeps doing these things in accordance with justice and Islam. They expand to Cyprus, to North Africa, to Sicily, the Mediterranean Sea, to Persia, and to Turkestan, but they don't advance to East Pakistan. Muslims don't take over Pakistan. And they don't go to India. Muslims had no interest because they were not a threat. All this expansion, all this beauty, all this wonderful stuff happening to the Muslims, their power throughout the world, and their justice, and their happiness, and their richness, in the time of Uthman anh, there was nobody poor enough to come and take zakat anymore because of the zakat system. Did you know that? No Muslim in the world under the Islamic empire was poor enough to come forward to take zakat money. Did you know that? Amazing. So it went to the public treasury. And Uthman anh, used to take from it and use it on soldiers and horsemen and he used to give it to um, businessmen to make it even better and, and employ other people, you know, and so on. Anyone who was in need, new people who converted to Islam, he used to use it for that. One day, a civil war broke out. And here is the story. Some clever people, clever, but really they were shifty people, they took advantage of Uthman's old age and his soft nature. Do you know how old Uthman anhu was in the 12th year of his Khilafah? He was 83 years old. White hair, 
very, you know, he was tired, he was weak, he was an old man. And people took advantage of that. He overlooked the faults of others. So some governors and officers, which he placed, started to be like the Persians and Romans, people of authority and power. They were not companions. There were people who embraced Islam later on. Like a dictatorship. And this grew until it was all over the Islamic regions. Dictatorship, power, mastery over people. There was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Sabah. He was a Jew who secretly embraced Islam, not telling people that he's a Jew. He was a hypocrite. And the Prophet wasallam said to Uthman, in Bukhari and Muslim this is, he said to him, O oh Uthman, the hypocrites are going to kill you. Abdullah ibn Sabah was an ex Jew. He lived in Yemen, in Najd, Yemen. And he was the one who stirred up the situation. He comes into Medina acting like a pious man, but he was actually a spy. He dressed well, he prayed well, he grew his beard. You know, all the stuff that we, some Muslims, take of utter importance and they forget about character and morals and values. I'll park in your driveway because I've got to pray Jummah. Doesn't matter if your mother is sick and the ambulance is there, she could die and rot because I'm praying Jummah. Or I grow my beard, man, so I am pious, I get to judge other people. You know what I'm saying? Superficial. This is important. But the inside has to reflect on the outside too. Without going to further detail, we can talk about that a lot. This guy acted like a Muslim. He fooled everybody. And what he did was what I'm sad to say, we don't want to be one of those because I see it happening today. He goes to Banu Hashim. Remember Banu Hashim wanted Ali radiallahu to be the Khalifa, right? He goes to Banu Hashim and he re realizes that they wanted him to be the Khalifa. So he takes advantage of that to make fitna and stir up trouble. Now it's conspiracy, you know, making up accusations. It's not like social media today. Someone says something, it goes straight there. I mean, it's good and bad. I don't know. It's good in the sense that everybody knows, you know, if something's going wrong. It's bad because people start defaming each other. So he goes up to Bunu Hisham and he says to them, you know, you were right. Ali radiallahu should have been the Khalifa. And he makes up a new slogan. Listen to this new slogan. He says, Love of the Prophet and love of his family should come first. Everybody loves the Prophet. Everybody loves his family. But what's the difference here? He's saying a word of truth, wanting enmity to develop from it. Sometimes I might tell you something that's correct, but my intention is to cause trouble. So he wanted truth, wanting trouble. And yes, the family of the Prophet should be the Khalifa. Shamli. He invented a new principle. Listen to this. He goes, every Prophet had a wasi. Every Prophet had someone who's got to take after him. Musa had his brother Harun as his wasi. You know, the one who should take after me. The closest wasi to the Prophet Sallallahu is Ali. Therefore, Ali is the rightful Khalifa and Uthman must be removed. Now, the companions didn't buy that. But who is, he, who is he after? He's after the ignorant and the weak. That's who he, And he can do it. Conspiracy manipulation. Like the way the media works today. So he goes off. And he finds people start to follow him. He secretly went around the cities and provinces. Campaigning and lobbying. He spoke secretly to head figures. People in power. And governors whom he knew had complaints about Uthman ibn Affan. Twelve years, people have complaints about him and about his certain decisions. He convinced many officers that Uthman radiallahu anhu was the real cause of all the trouble. Get the head. So, there was a secret society that developed in Egypt. They looked religious. They loved Islam, apparently. They came up with their own idea. They were pious and sincere, but they were fake. Have you heard of FRGs? Fake religious guy? Fake religious girl? 
That's what we call them, FRGs. Act pious on the outside, in secret, whatever. This is how these guys were. And their main aim was political power. So they come from Egypt into Medina. And they focused on complaints. Complain, complain, complain. Is that, does that sound familiar? Instead of being productive, let's just complain. This person doesn't do that. This person no good. This person no that. Me, I do everything. Complaints. Muslims are back. Muslims are backwards. Muslims don't do anything. But what are you doing? Do what you have in skills, but you know, even if a little bit. No, they were people of complaint. They campaigned against all the officers as insufficient, and they said they're not even God-fearing. All the officers of Man Puri said they're not God-fearing. Who are we to judge who's God-fearing? Allah says Allah knows who's God-fearing. And they started to forge letters, and they were sent out to city after city, saying that there is injustice and unrest in the capital city of Medina. And they said that Ali, Talha, Zubair, and others, their families of the Prophet ﷺ, were in support of this movement, but they lied. They were not in support of this movement. So people started thinking that there's widespread unrest under the Khalifa, and therefore the Khalifa must be removed. He's not a good leader. Twelve years later, they say this, in the last year of his Khilafah, when he's an old man. Abdullah ibn Sabah creates a bad attitude. You know what the bad attitude he created in people that he went to? Judging and accusing. Who? Judging and accusing one type of people. Judging and accusing the religious people. Not the non-Muslims, the religious people. And the companions of the Prophet. And examples of how he did it. This is an, a few examples. He says, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, the governor of Kufa, who Uthman put, he used to tell people about how they used to walk on foot to the battlefield and how much reward it was in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So one day they see this governor riding on a horse to the battlefield. So he comes up and he starts saying, Huh? Look at this governor. He says one thing but does the other. Why does he go to the battlefield riding on a horse when he sits there chanting to us about how they used to walk on foot. Why doesn't he earn the greater reward from Allah and walk on his foot? Sounds familiar? Overwhelming complaints gathered on Uthman's door in Medina until he was forced to, re to, to take Abu Musa al-Ash'ari off his, his um, office just to keep the peace. And he appoints Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Amr. But Abdullah ibn Sabah goes off on that and he goes, look at him. He puts an inexperienced young man Uthman only chose him because he's related to him. Look, Uthman is filling posts with his family. Walid was replaced by Sa'd ibn al-As. The fitna makers kept on making trouble. They're going around meetings, you know, sitting with the people in their meetings, stirring up trouble. And then they started to get violent. Again, they justified their violence. They said, anybody who doesn't agree with us, it means that you want an oppressive leader. And anyone who wants an oppressive leader is a hypocrite, he ought to be fought. Because the will of Allah is more important and justice is more important. But they fabricated everything. So one day they beat up a guy. They punched and beat up a guy who was in one of the meetings. And they found a religious justification to do it. I remember in Lebanon, this group used to come up and they used to, and they used to use knives to stab people in the mosque because they thought that everybody's a kafir. I still remember that, subhanAllah. So Osman wanted to deal with these people. So he sends them off to Muawiyah, who was in Syria, Muawiyah. And he thinks that it will set them straight. So Muawiyah is very kind to them. He says, listen guys, you're doing the wrong thing. This is not right. This is not how the Prophet ﷺ taught us. You know, he's a companion. They didn't listen to him. So he sends them off to who? To the son of Khalid ibn walid The son of Khalid ibn walid was very strong. And he set them straight. And so they went straight and they repented. But not for long. They go back to Iraq. And what happens? They come back with more news. People are stirring up stuff. Uthman gets accused by many things. They go to him, hey, he uses public pastures for his own use. He uses public land for his own use. He prevents people from using them. It's wrong of him to make four copies of the Quran in his time. 
Uthman is the one who made four copies of the Qur'an and gave each governor, one for Sham and Kufa and Egypt and in Medina. He makes four copies of the Qur'an and sends each to a province. This is Bid'ah. They called it Bid'ah. And he goes, because he wants his governors to play around with the Qur'an and edit it. So he goes and writes it and compiles it. This is Bid'ah. Look what we have today, alhamdulillah. Is it Bid'ah? We still have the same Qur'an. And he appoints young men as officers. He favors his relatives and gives them wealth. He gives his friends land. He kills innocent lives. These are all the things that he said. So Uthman sends for governors to meet with him in Medina. And they come together. And he said, what should I do with these guys? And they go, we declare jihad against them. Uthman looks at them and he said, jihad against Muslims? He said, no, by Allah, I will not lift a sword and not one of you will ever lift a sword. I will not be the first Khalifa in which I will be known that in my time I shed blood of Muslims. No. And if it happens to get to that, he said, I will let them kill me better than the Muslims killing each other. I'm an old man. And the Prophet ﷺ told me I'll be a shaheed anyway. I've got nothing to worry about. So they go back. And Muawiyah says to him, listen Uthman, if you're in trouble, come to Syria, leave Medina, we'll protect you over here. You haven't got many men there. He only had like 500 people, men, women and children. He goes, you're not protected there. He said, Wallahi, I will not leave the neighbor of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And I will not abandon Medina. No, I'm staying here. So the rebels, they used this opportunity to stir up trouble while governors were away. And they come to uh, Medina with 700 men. I'm almost done. They come with 700 men. These are the rebels, the extremists. I call them extremists. Who later on become the Khawarij. Okay? Even a more extremist group at the time of Ali Allah. They were well organized. They had great army. They were well prepared. They were coming to kill and fight. So they come to Medina and they face Uthman. And Uthman radiallahu anhu, he sends someone out. He says, find out what they want. And he comes back and he says, they're going to try and argue with you. And then they're going to take away some words back to Iraq and to Egypt and Syria. And they're going to tell them that you did not fulfill their requests. And then they're going to gather armies to come and overthrow you and kill you. Uthman goes, kill me? Why would they want to kill me? Killing someone is only if, they, if I was a murderer, if I had raped someone or something like that. Not, not because I'm, I've made some mistakes. So they go to him and they debate him. And he answers to them. He goes, the public pasture that you talk about, that I use, I've got two camels. And I go and I lead Hajj, as you know. And you know I was a successful businessman before, so I've got land, which is my own. Those I denied it, like if I didn't let people use the public land, there were people who were bribing other people to sell them land. And I don't allow bribery. As for making four copies of the Qur'an, he goes, you know, it's only one book of Allah sent. And we have one copy. I sent authorized copies to the governors which were compiled by the same companions who wrote it in front of the Prophet ﷺ. How can you accuse me of wanting to edit it? And Abu Bakr compiled it and it's helping the Muslims, it's not a bid'ah. He goes, as for appointing young men, I appointed qualified men. The Prophet ﷺ appointed Usama ibn Zaid. Remember, he was a 17-year-old commander. I haven't done anything wrong. As for favoring and loving my relatives, he goes, there's nothing wrong with loving my relatives and giving them gifts. The gifts were from my private wealth. And I was doing it before I became a Khalifa. I just continued looking after my relatives. Any public money is used for public people. I didn't give my friends lands. They earned those lands and they fought, they were soldiers and they earned it and sold it to people in Medina. I didn't give anything to anybody. Killing innocent lives. He said, I didn't kill anybody except on the had what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered me to do. Just like my friends Abu Bakr and Umar. So the rebels, they all went quiet. But they were still not satisfied because they have a motive. They go back to Iraq and they go, hey, let's go tell him that he didn't listen to us. So they went to Ali, Zubair, Talha and told them, why don't you go and become leaders? Why don't you overthrow Uthman? You know, you're more worthy for it. And Ali, Talha and Zubair all said, never. We will pledge allegiance to Uthman and we'll follow him. So these guys, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu went up to them. He had spoken to Uthman and he said, listen, listen, Uthman. Just, you know, start listening to my advice instead of the advice of your cousins. And Uthman goes into the mosque and he stands up and he says, Oh people, there are complaints against me and I have answers to them. But if I have made a mistake, he started crying. He said, please tell me and I am ready to fix them by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and I will now listen to Ali as my advisor. So Ali radiallahu chases up to those rebels that left. Some went to Iraq, some went to Egypt, some went to Basra, so different directions. And he says to the people of Egypt, because the people of Egypt wanted Ali, he says to them, listen, everything's solved. This is what Uthman said. He's going to take my advice. And then they were satisfied. They go, all right, beautiful. He, he returns, and then suddenly someone puts a fake letter. And the letter said, these rebels, O oh governors, when they reach you, kill them. Kill them. No one knows where this letter came from. And he had the seal of Uthman radiallahu anhu on it. Historians say that he had lost his seal, but someone had forged it. When they returned, suddenly they were at the door of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And they were all chanting, Revenge! 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 He comes out, he goes, what's going on? He said, we got, a, we got a letter that you wanted us dead as soon as we arrive. Ali radiallahu anhu susses this out. He's very sus about it. Yeah, suspicious. So he comes up to him and he says, hold on. If the Egyptians came with this letter, what are you Kufan people and you Basra people doing here? You know, you're supposed to be going that way. How did you get the news so quick? You know, it takes about a couple of days to get to you. How did you know about it? And you just, he, he go, they go, we've come to support our allies. He said, how would you know so quick? He goes, someone among you is a hypocrite and he's stirring up trouble. So you know what they said to him? This is typical of people who've got an evil goal. They said, think what you want to think. This is what we want. You think the way. You can interpret it any way you like. So they go to him. So why did you and Aisha send us a letter to come back and overthrow the Khalifa anyway? Ali radiallahu says, I've never sent that letter to you. Aisha radiallahu she says, my hand has never touched ink in that way. I don't know. Nobody sent that letter. And then they go to him, all right, famous statement, wallahi, this is, this is authentic. They said to him, you're either with us or against us. Wallahi, they said, you're either with us or against us. Khalas, when they want trouble, the shaitan... So Ali radiallahu anhu realized how they were trying to drag him into the Khilafah. So he goes and sits away. He says, you're not going to use me as your pawn. So he goes away and the rioters go in front of Uthman radiallahu anhu in the house. And Uthman says, Wallahi, I did not order your death. Wallahi, I did not order your death. Then they go to him. If you wrote the letter to kill us, then you shouldn't be the Khalifa. But if you did not write the letter and it was come and forged to us and you didn't know about it, then you're also a bad leader. You don't deserve to be a Khalifa. <coughs> so someone comes in. Almost done. Inshallah. 15 minutes. So someone comes in and he says, Ya Uthman, they want to kill you. Or you, gotta get, you can't be a Khalifa anymore. Uthman remembers what the Prophet ﷺ said to him. He said, O oh Uthman, Allah will give you the robe of leadership. Do not take it off when the hypocrites demand you to do so. Until you meet me. Until you die. And he said it three times. So he said, I will not take off the robe of honor which Allah had made me wear. What happens next is the worst thing that ever happened in history to the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Forty days they were protesting and then 20 days they made a siege around Uthman's house 700 people surrounded his house with no one to protect him and they would not let him go out to pray Imam anymore he was denied going to the masjid so they go and elect someone among them to pray Imam and the other companions wouldn't pray behind them so then Uthman orders them to pray behind them you know why? Uthman separated political agenda and worship. He said, politics is in Islam, but do not mix it with worship. Pray behind anyone who prays Imam. Just go for it. Don't worry about me. And so Uthman stayed in his house, praying, reading the Quran, fasting, and he could not get out. Then they heightened the siege, and they started preventing water, water from even entering the house of Uthman. They couldn't drink, so they started to go thirsty him and his family. When Ali radiallahu anhu heard about this, he comes back and was very upset. So he gets some barrels of water to bring them in. And nobody would stop Ali radiallahu anhu. 
So they started drinking again. Then Ali went away. Then Umm Habiba, the Prophet's wife, Umm al Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers. She feels sorry for Uthman. So she comes on a camel and carrying some water to go to Uthman. She thinks, I'm the mother of the believers, they're not going to harm me. So they looked at her and they started abusing her. And they started, they, one of them slapped her camel, which fell, and she almost fell and he almost trampled over her. The mother of the, she goes, Will they kill the mother of their believers? Their own mother? So she goes back to Aisha radiallahu anha and they stay away. These guys are crazy. No respect even to Prophet's wives, the mother of the believers. And so, Uthman stands up on the, on the uh, roof and he says to everyone, O oh, companions, the companions come and the rebels are standing there. So he says to the companions, Do you bear witness that the Prophet said, I am a shaheed? And they all said with one word, Yes, we bear witness. Then he said, do you bear witness that the Prophet ﷺ told me not to give up this Khilafah? And they all said yes. Then he goes, Allahu Akbar, O protesters, do you hear? I've never apostated, I never murdered anyone, I never committed adultery, why do you want to kill me? If you kill me, you will never unite again, and bloodshed will be forever. Then their ringleader goes, Manipulator! Manipulator! And the rioters kept on going. Uthman anhu goes back inside his house. And it was almost time for Hajj season. And the rebels are thinking, if we let them go to Hajj, they'll group each other and they'll get helpers. And by the time they return, they'll kill us or they'll probably stop us from our rioting. So they wanted to take action quickly before anybody comes back. Uthman is still by himself. He's only got a couple of companions to protect him. Nobody's really there. So they group up and they tell Uthman, you better get off before we kill you. And he would not budge. A man, a sahabi named Mughira, he comes in and he says, Oh, Amir al muminin what will we say to Allah if we don't protect you? I've got to protect you. He says, don't lift the sword. But he wouldn't listen. He goes outside to fight them off and they kill him. Then suddenly, Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr al-Anhu's son, Muhammad, there were only two uh, tabi'in, they weren't companions, who followed this rebel group, Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr and Muhammad ibn Ja'far. And they tried to convince him not to go with these extremists. But he wouldn't be convinced. He was brainwashed by them. So he was also against Uthman. And now the water is denied again. They're not drinking. They've got no food. They've got no supplies. They can't go to the masjid. And Umar ibn Khal and Uthman radiallahu anhu is stuck in there. It kept on going until the last day. Uthman goes to sleep, fasting. And he sees the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his dreams. And Abu Bakr is with him and Umar. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to Uthman, Ya Uthman, Attashuk, O oh Uthman, they made you thirsty. Ya Uthman, Hasaruk, O oh Uthman, they, say, they saged you, they went let you out. Ya Uthman, do you want to break your fast with us tonight? And then Uthman wakes up. He gathers his family, his children, his slaves, whoever they were. And he frees all his 20 slaves. He changes his clothing and wears something tighter and longer. In case they killed him and his aura would show, he was very shy, remember? He wants to cover himself. And he says to his wife, Atika, he says, I don't want to eat. For the Prophet ﷺ said to me, you will meet me fasting. So I want to stay fasting and break my fast with the Prophet ﷺ. The next day Fajr came. And Uthman, 83 year old man, weak, and all he wants is peace between the Muslims. He puts his own life on the line. He says, let them kill me. But I will not give up my Khilafah. Why? He doesn't want the world to know that a bunch of bigots and rioters of 700 can take off the leader of the believers. He didn't want that to be a Sunnah later on. He wants the Khalifa and leadership to be strong. So he says to his wife, I'm fasting and I would like you to leave my house. It was a big palace. Go to the other rooms. I don't want you to be harmed. So they listened to him. 
And he says, I want a Zubair to bury me if I am killed. Then he wrote a letter, Uthman. He says, Uthman bears witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Jannah is true. Hellfire is true. And Allah will raise me up. This is true. On it, Uthman lives. On it, Uthman dies. And on it, Uthman will be raised. Suddenly, Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr, he is the first one to come in. He sees Uthman radiallahu anhu while Uthman is reading the Quran. And he grabs his beard and he shakes it. Muhammad, son of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Uthman looks up at him and for the first time he shows firmness in the toughness or in the harshness. He says to him, Woe to you, Muhammad. Wallahi, if your father was alive, he would never do what you are doing. Between me and you is the book of Allah. And for some reason, Muhammad shook and he went pale and he got very scared. So he ran away and never took part in the Reb with the rebels ever again until he died. Then suddenly, two men, one of them was called al Maut al-Aswad, Black Death. That was his, that's what they called him, I don't know his name. He was known to kill and do things. And with him was another man called Saudan ibn Hamdan and a few others. They enter. And the first thing uh, the death, uh, black death does, he grabs a rope while, while Uthman radiallahu anhu is reading the Quran and he puts it around his neck and starts choking him. Subhanallah, this hypocrite man, he says, I am the one who killed Uthman. <laughs> I found him when I was choking him. He was moving around like a, someone who was possessed with a jinn. Oh, how easy. Oh, how easy choking him was. This, this la'in. And then suddenly, his wife comes to protect him, Atika. She comes in. She places her hand out as they drew out the sword. And they chop off his, her four fingers. And she goes away screaming. Then, this man, Saudan, he comes up to Uthman radiallahu anhu. Uh, sorry, Mawt uh, al-Aswad, he comes up to Uthman and he tries to strike Uthman's head with the sword and Uthman puts his hand up to protect himself and he chops off his right hand and the blood falls on the Qur'an and Uthman looks at his hand and he says Wallahi lahiya awwalu kaffin khattat al-Qur'an by Allah, this hand is the first one that wrote from the Qur'an. And, see, this is... And then, his blood falls on the Qur'an, and the blood comes on one ayah. The ayah says, فَسَيَكْفِيكَهُمُ Allah. Allah will save you from them. Brothers and sisters, this Mus'haf, it's called Mus'haf Uthman. If you don't believe me, it's still in the museum in Istanbul. And I saw it with my eyes. It is the same copy that was in his hand with the blood right on that verse. You can go and see it or look it up on Google if you like. And then came the other guy and he stabs Uthman six stabbings with his dagger. And this is what he says. Three times he stabbed him, he says, this is three for the sake of Allah. See? And six, because of a grudge I had against you. And so Uthman radiallahu anhu dies. And he meets up with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The companions find out and they go berserk. Ali radiallahu anhu hears about it. And he starts to cry and he says, Tabban lahum, woe to them and what they have done. I ask Allah to unite me with Uthman in Jannah. Uthman, the beloved of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Ali radiallahu starts crying for him. He says, if you want to pledge allegiance to me, wallahi, I'm too embarrassed to put my hand out. Other companions also cried. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, every time he remembered this with Uthman, he used to cry heavily throughout the night. The rebels came along and they said to Ali, we have killed him for the sake of Allah. 
And he said, Wallahi, you have not done so. Later on, a few days passed, and some of them they regretted. And they said, we shouldn't have killed Uthman. And you know what Ali radiallahu anhu said to them? He said, you are like that verse in the Quran. كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ كفر فَلَمَّا كَفَرَ إِنِّي قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ you are like the shaitan who says to the person, become a kafir. When a person becomes a kafir, the shaitan says, I am innocent. You are nothing but shayateen. My brothers and sisters in Islam, such was the story of Uthman. And this is what happened in the time of Uthman. The next thing that happens is with Ali radiallahu anhu. And what happens with the Muslim is even more tragic. Yet for us, we can learn many lessons so that we can practice today among us. Brothers and sisters, love each other. Brothers and sisters, we have none, no one else but each other. We have no one else but each other. Support one another. Assume well of one another. If somebody makes a mistake, go to him in private or her. Speak to them like a brother would speak to his own brother or a sister. Like a parent would speak to their own child. Wish good for your brothers and sisters. You know, nobody really wants to do bad. Or maybe they do. But everybody, you know, people, they're all potential people to become better people. Wallahi, if you make a relationship with someone, that person will listen. But don't be distant. And be, my dear brothers and sisters, as Rasul said, Ikhwanan. And I finish it with this verse. Allah said, <laughs> Verily, believers are brothers and sisters. Allah says, So fear Allah in your relationships with one another so that Allah can give you mercy. I thank you for listening. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. I apologize for taking too long. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.